All right, we're back with more Triple Triad Strategy, this time talking about a new way of meeting corner starters, namely adjacent corners. So what does this do? So if we have a corner starter that the opponent has played in, say, one, we can meet it with a move in three or seven, one of the nearby corners, not the opposite corner. I think that is a very different type of reply. And I think this does a few things. One, it can pressure the side of a starter you cannot naturally take. So if they play a starter in one, and you can take it from two, but not four, playing in seven can help you set up against the side you could not normally take. It can give you a same or a plus in four, and that can give you access to their starter that you did not initially have. It can also, of course, thus give you a same or plus in a square your opponent doesn't have one in between the two corners. So in that case, you might be able to set yourself up for a same or plus in four when they do not also have a same or plus in four. They will presumably have a way to take back their starter from four, but they might not have a card that can perform double duty and take both cards in one and seven, while you will have set yourself up to have that card. And because you can create a threat in a square where they don't have something good to do, this will often induce opponents to block that square, to block your threat there, while if it is left open, they don't think they'll have a good play in it at the end of the game. And from here, we can reach an L formation. So if there are cards in 1, 4, and 7, we can play in 2 or 8 and set up an L. We talked a bunch about the L in the uh, Starter Capture series, but here it's often going to be even stronger because it's not just going to be an L, which second turn often really likes, but it's going to be an L, it's going to be a secured L. It's going to be an L where we control the card that is locked in, right? If we play in two, when there are cards in one, four, and seven, we lock in the card in one. Well, if we play in eight, we can lock in the card in seven. And either way, not only have we reached an L, which second turn is often going to be really happy about, but we've reached a particularly advantageous L where the key card is already under our control. And often who's favored in an L, as is the case with many structures, Qs, Ts, is going to be who has that locked in card. Finally, uh, first turn also, of course, is last turn. So if we leave the squares next to their starter empty, often they have one card to take back each way. But on last turn, they'll only have one card left. And so whichever card they hold on to, we can try to force them to play it in the square where it is not naturally good. And so one thing that's useful to do or useful to consider when playing in an adjacent corner is if they have a card that takes back in two and we're setting up something in four, making sure not to let that same card also be good in four because then they can just hold that card for either of those two squares. So this is all fairly straightforward stuff, but I wanted to go over the kind of standard things I'm thinking about when looking at a move in this square. So here's a hand where... We looked at this from Blue's perspective before in the capture series, and uh, Blue only has one capture of Red Starter, and we looked at 2, 3, 6, 6, and 2, and you could sneak a tie there, but the follow-ups were kind of poor and hard to play, and you really had to find those weak defensive corners. So after they recapture, I think the best follow-up was 6, 3, 2, 6, and 3, which is a quite difficult move to find because it set up some combo potential against Red's hand trying to play in five after. But all in all, taking was not very favorable. Blue had to follow it up really precisely to have chances to tie, and this is not how Blue wants to be playing, because Blue put no pressure on Red in those lines and had to find very good moves themselves to just survive. So what if instead we look to play an adjacent corner? And one thing with uh, one other problem with the move in two was also when red recaptured they got to set up pluses and sames in five specifically a plus in five blue captures in two red recaptures with cactuar in four and red has a combo in five and blue does two but red usually has first access to five because in those setups with cards in one two four and five Blue never really wants to go on five. It's very dangerous. It gives red tons of options. I talked a lot about this, which means red has first access to five. So if we both have something good to do in five there, it's usually going to strongly favor the first turn player. So here, taking wasn't appealing, and instead, we're going to look to try an adjacent corner. Now, we want to set up against the card in one, and we can already take from two, but we can't take from four. So we're probably going to be looking at moves in seven rather than moves in three. We really try to set up against the side where we're not already strong. Now, 2636 six is their recapture in two, and that's really the first card I look at, is what's their recapture in two? How can I play a card in seven that sets up me in four, 
but not their two card to also be good in four. So they don't have this card that's just dominant in a lot of squares. Sometimes your move in seven is going to set up some of their cards to combo, and that's okay as long as it's a different card than the one they're using to recapture in two. We don't want them to have the same card for both two and four. We want them to need different cards for those spots. So a move like 6632 in seven might set us up for a combo. Here it doesn't, but let's pretend it did. But it would also set up under Lizard, their 2636, to be dominant in both two and four. So that's the kind of card I would discard quite quickly, the kind of move, even though it might have some other benefits. And actually here I don't think it's that bad a move, but it's a bit dangerous to allow one card to be that powerful. So we want to play in seven, and we want to play such that their 2636 isn't set up. So we don't want to six facing up, but we do want to set up a combo against their card in one. So I think this is the best move. And my reason for this is one, it sets up a combo against their card in one. Our 2366 is now a plus in four. Two, it is easy for us to recapture from eight. And three, it does not set up their 2636 to dominate in four as well as two. Right? They have some cards that are good in four, they have some cards that are good in two, but there is no overlap between the two cards. And that's really important because first turn always ends the game with one card left, and as long as that one card is only good in one square, we can force them to play it in a different one by blocking that one square on last turn. So this is my preferred way I'd try to set play an adjacent corner here. I think it's quite strong and red's going to have to be fairly careful to hold on to this game. And we're going to consider responses in four, responses blocking the in-between square during this uh, video, but in others we'll branch out a bit and look at other kinds of moves. So here, if blue plays in four, we're going to be able to combo everything back from two. And they don't have a way to avoid this, and this is a very dangerous situation already for red. Um, note, they do have combos in five, but we can combo back and lock in the card in either seven or the card in two after. We control the card in one for life, so we just have this fundamental advantage that they have no locked in cards and we already have a locked in card. Um, these situations are just very hard to hold for red, and this is just a very favorable L. Um, here, red does have a save. Six, seven, two, three, and six sets up just enough combo potential for them to hold. Both their cards after it are very good in three and they have some combo setups in five and they do manage to survive but i don't think any other move survives here uh, so red is already in just a very tough situation and any move they play in four they're gonna have to if they don't lose on the spot they're just in a ton of trouble here and blue in this case has a tie some of the other moves there i do not believe have any ties after and you can see the strength of the l here and how difficult it is for red to survive. I think one key point is also that blue has combos in five. So if red wants to go in three, it's very easy for blue to set up a, to play a same in five, and red won't have the ability to combo back. But this should be understood as this is a very favorable L. Blue has the secured card. This is exactly what we're looking for when we play an adjacent corner. This is the, the dream situation, and it's very easy to win a lot of games out of this kind of setup. So here's a different hand, and here's another hand where the capture had some appeal but didn't work out great. Um, there were a few different ways to capture. Some worked out better than others, but blue might be thinking okay i don't want to capture and obviously most players didn't actually you know aspire to capture starters but let's look for an adjacent corner and what are the things we might notice well first in this case we have the plus wall in four and we've seen that plus walling is worth more than raw capturing in the last situation if we go back we got to combo all the cards when we plus walled and when we, when we have a plus wall, it's much harder for our opponent to play next to their card because we can take it back and potentially flip combo stuff down the road. So we can already take from both sides, but if we're going to set up on one side or the other, we want to set up against the side where we don't have the plus wall because the plus wall is so much more powerful in effect to have. So in here, we have two different ways to plus wall in four, so we want to set up against two. And so I think here the better uh, adjacent corners are going to be in three rather than seven. So we can already capture um, from two, it should say. We can capture from two. But having that plus wall, that plus or that same, is worth more than just a capture. So we want to set up. 
And we have five different cards we could play in three. And there's, I think there's a very interesting question of which card is best there, right? What matters most? Do we want to retain directional strength? If so, we might not want to play our card with a seven up or one of our cards with a six up, because when we play in three, the game will be directed upwards and we might want to keep our upward power. Um, is what matters most setting up that same or plus in two? We already have a way to capture in two, so we don't need to set up a same or plus there. But of course, we'd be very happy to get a same or plus as well. Is it having the plus wall in six, right? So if we play in three, they're like, they have a decent chance to play in two, and we might want to play a, an L setup. And we could play an L setup by going in four, but we could also play an L setup by going in six. So is the most important thing to look for in a move in three how we set up a plus wall in six? That's a good question. Um, another thing is we could set up something hard to take. Red is going to be very good at recapturing their starter, but they're not so good at taking other things away from their starter. So maybe the thing we want to do with our move in six is set up something hard for them to take. So there's lots of different things we could be thinking, and I don't think it's obvious which one prevails. So if we look at these criteria, we have three different cards that can go in three, and they set up a same or plus for us. Uh, 6273 sets up a same uh, with the 3376 and 2. 4761 sets up an obscure plus with the 1 and 6 on our first card, um, Shield Dragon. Uh, 6247 also sets up a plus with Blue Dragon and 2, 6273. So there are lots of ways to set up a same or plus. Now, if we decided the most important thing is to keep a lot of up value while well, we could play 3376, or we could play 4761 to keep our up value, use the cards with the lowest up value. If we wanted to um, have a plus wall in six after we played in three, a move like 4761 jumps out because we have two different cards that can plus wall that six facing down, so it would be the easiest card to secure to lock in. If we wanted to use our weakest card, we might say, okay, 7651 is probably our weakest overall card. It has the least plus wall potential, so maybe we'd look to use that one. If we wanted to look to avoid giving them a same or a plus, well, we might say 3376 gives their 2636 a same, or 6247 gives them a plus with 6263, and that plus looks especially troublesome because that card that has the plus 6263 is also their card for four, so we don't want to give them the same card that works well in both two and four, so that might be a reason not to want to play that card. And uh, another thing to notice is both 3376 and 6273 are the hardest for them to capture from six with its seven down, but also we can't capture that seven either, so that might be something to worry about with those moves. And so there's just, there's a lot to consider here, and I think in the capturing examples, we could kind of calculate these clear lines where we could say, I'm going to capture their starter, they basically have to recapture, and then I'm going to play in one of the corners, and I'm specifically going to play in it with my main goal being controlling five. And I think we could come up with a clear plan, and we could figure out our next two moves from the starting position, because we'd play this forcing line, and this line where I hope we understand the themes too. Here, there's just a lot more themes going on. And so I think in this case, what matters most is actually somewhat similar to what matters most last time, because we've seen that what matters most in L's is control of five. So here, I should say, maybe I'll, I'll say later, so okay, I won't say yet, but what we want to do is look after I play in three, if they go in two, do I have a good setup move in four or six that sets up me to control five better than they do? And if we can set up better for five, it's usually going to work out pretty well for us. It will force them to occupy five, and then we'll have lots of options. Say there are cards in one, two, three, four, and five. We'll often have a very good move in seven there. Sometimes we'll have a good move in six. Sometimes we'll have a nice setup in nine. It's the kind of position where blue often has pretty good options if we've secured the card in one, which we will have secured in those setups. So... I think the key is making sure we have a better move there in five than they do. And by the key, I don't mean the only thing that matters. I don't mean it overrules all the other things we talked about. Again, these positions are tricky. There's a lot to consider. But I think it's the most useful thing to be able to calculate is to think, okay, I go three, they go two. Do I have a good move to set up in four or six that gives me five, but not them five? And so the thing that really jumps out at to me the, the move sequence that jumps out, and you can pause and look for a little if you want, is if we go 7, 6, 5, 1, and 3, 
and they go in two. And let's assume when they go in two, they go with a really high outfacing value. Safety is really important. Three, two, seven, six, and two feels very natural. It is the highest number facing five. It is a high enough n number facing the card in one that we, when we uh, plus wall one, we don't combo it. So I think it's safe to assume they're gonna try to block. If they block the two square, they're gonna be very biased to block it with the three, two, seven, six. And so when we play in four or six, we want to be setting up against that downward facing seven. So the sequence that appeals to me is seven, six, five, one, and three. They go three, two, seven, six, and two. And then we can play six, two, four, seven, and six. And the key here is we have that L where we have the controlled card in three, potentially is comboable back. We haven't quite secured it because it's been taken twice by overpowering. But we have a plus in five and they don't. And so they don't have a natural good move in five. In fact, they don't have any move in five that captures our card in six. And we do have a combo in five. And I think that's very likely to lead to a favorable situation for us. It may not lead to a win, but I think they're going to be under pressure and we're going to have a pretty safe setup. And so that's the kind of thing I'd look for most here. I think all the other principles I brought up really matter and are worth considering and are often reasons to prefer one move to another, there's not going to be kind of some simple rule of how we set up L's or and how we play adjacent corners. But I think the most valuable thing to look for in an adjacent corner is the kind of L you're going to set up. And I think this matters even more in closed, where looking, I'm going to play this adjacent corner, and if they block the in-between square, here is how I set up an L, and just looking to set up favorable L's against that kind of blocking move is uh, very valuable and picks up a lot of wins quite easily. I should note, in closed, they should pretty much never block two there, but I think players do all the time, and it's worth making sure you're set up to punish that as much as possible. So, so are we going to go to the next slide? I've been having trouble switching. So a few more thoughts about these adjacent corner moves before I end this video. It directs the game towards a specific side of the board, and so it is worth keeping more power in the direction, right? If you put cards in one and three, the game is an upward tilt. And I think good players will respond often there by going in seven, eight, or nine and trying to stop the game having that directional tilt. I think if we pause and look at this position and look at um, moves in three here, I think a really good response for red to any move in three is six, seven, two, three, and seven, which is not something we talked about. We only talked about blocking moves. But you'll notice their two, six, three, six is really good in two, but not good in four. And if they can set it up to be good in both squares, that would be really good for red. And six, seven, two, three, and seven gives it a plus in four, and in fact, a plus wall in eight. And I think that's a pretty strong move and gonna make sure red can at least tie against any move we play in three, and is probably a more pressuring move than any of the blocking two moves. Um, so good players will look for more distant options, but I think a lot of people naturally block two, and if we set up to have a bigger threat in two in the in-between square of the two corners, a lot of players will feel under a ton of pressure and will choose to block that square. And this happens up to high levels, especially in open. And that doesn't mean it's wrong, I'll get to that in a sec, but it is worth really assuming that there's a fair chance the game will be highly directed in the direction you are giving the direction, uh, giving the game, I said the word direction too many times, it's now lost all meaning, and considering which cards to hold on to based on the impending directionality of the game is a useful heuristic to have. Uh, one other thing is even if we don't set up a same or a plus or a capture, if we can take their starter from one side but not the other, playing the adjacent corner still on that other side, even if it doesn't set us up, can sort of block up that part of the board and make it a little less problematic that we don't have a capture there. And in closed, we can often bluff having set up a capture there, even if we don't have it, making it an even more appealing option in closed. Um, another uh, thing I like about it is I find it's a really counterattacking option. It says, I'm going to set up the game such that I am pressuring your starter, I am setting up ways to capture it in a way where you're going to feel under pressure to block that in-between square, but if you do, I'm going to be able to set up these L's. And if you don't, then I've perhaps set up squares with combos that you don't have access to the same combos I do. I gave myself a same or a plus, and hopefully I didn't give you them. And so I think for kind of counter-attacking players, this is a really appealing option 
Uh, I really liked these options. I think uh, they're Turd's favorite reply to corner starters. There are a bunch of players where this is the most, their favored way of replying to corner starters. I don't think they're everyone's favorite way. Delial, I think, is more likely to play in cent the center or the far corner. I think Slash of Time is someone who would reliably play in the or play in the far corner more than a lot of people would. Um, I'm not saying it's the best way, but I think for a certain style of player, it's a very appealing way to reply to a corner starter. Here, we focused on situations only where they blocked the in-between square. And on some rule sets I've talked about closed, I just think this is out and out a mistake and you should basically never do it unless your hand is just utter garbage and doesn't work. But I focused on it here because first of all, it's a very common response across lots of rule sets, including open. And second, I do actually think it's the key reply because when our adjacent corner doesn't work, it is usually the way to punish it. And so I think it's kind of the highest volatility type of reply in that sometimes it falls apart immediately, as we saw, and they should never play there, but will still feel pressure to. And sometimes it is the best move, and it's the important thing to check. And when looking to play an adjacent corner, the main thing we should be thinking and calculating is what will we do when they block the in-between square. And so my thought process looks something like, which side of their starter do I have more trouble taking? I will use the adjacent corner to better set up to be able to take that side. And then I will very much look to what else can I set up afterwards if they play in that blocking square. And I think that's a good starting thought process to how to find good adjacent corner moves, though it does not take us all the way at all. And there's going to be a bunch more complexity here. And as we saw from a list of potential criteria, there's a lot going on. But I think that's a good starting place. And I'm going to start there next time as this is our default way of thinking, and then we'll try to improve upon that. And lastly, I want to say it is not entirely dissimilar from the immediate captures. I wanted to follow up doing capture videos with doing adjacent corner videos because they are the two responses that most likely lead to L's. And I think L's are a very interesting structure, very useful from the second player, a second turn player's point of view. But this version is a bit different. I think it's less forcing. Our opponent has a lot more options. When we capture, they almost always immediately have to capture back. Here, they have a lot more options. We focused on blocking moves, but there are lots of distant options. I mentioned one towards the end. And that makes this vaguer, which means the opponent has to make more moves on their own, right? They can't just correctly recapture every time we do this. They have to figure something out. And that makes it a better winning chance, certainly, but often a more dangerous attempt as well, because the game's going to remain more complex for longer. And so this is my first video on meeting corner starters with adjacent corners. I hope it gave a kind of quick thought process of where we're starting to think about these moves, but also that the scope of these is going to be hard to capture in videos because there's so many different criteria to be looking at, and it's not always clear which moves matter. And in my second example, I think all the moves in three were basically okay, some for different reasons, some were more complex, some when they took in two, it was justified because we could combo back in four, but we didn't actually have the recapture in six. Some would be sacrificing the card forever, but we were confident that the L starting with the move in four would work. You know, they worked in different ways and we didn't go too much into them. But I think the core idea of the adjacent corner is pressure their starter, specifically pressure the side we have less natural play against, and then set up L's. And L's are, you know, just a wonderful, wonderful thing for a second turn player. And they're most likely to be gotten out of captures and out of adjacent corners. But adjacent corners are much more likely to have them specifically with the um, secured card under our second turn control rather than the first turn player's control, as we saw so often with capturing the starter immediately. So in general, I think this is a more likely to be good reply and one that puts more pressure on the first turn player and was more my taste. Um, yep.